Hey, this is Dave DeCamp from Antiwar.com, and this is Antiwar News for Tuesday, September 6, 2022. First story at the top of Antiwar.com today, things are not looking good for the Iran nuclear deal. The European Union's top diplomat on Monday said that the prospects of reviving the Iran nuclear deal, known as the JCPOA, are in danger after Washington's negative reaction to Iran's latest response in the ongoing negotiations. So this is Joseph Burrell. He's the EU's foreign policy chief. He spearheaded this effort to revive the deal. He said, quote, the positions are not closer. If the process does not converge, then the whole process is in danger, end quote. So again, he's been brokering these negotiations. The EU recently put forward what they called a final proposal to revive the JCPOA. And Monday's comments, uh, this is really the first time that Burrell sounded negative when he was talking about these talks since they put forward this proposal. Before, he he had a lot of positive things to say. He was hoping that they're going to be able to sign a deal in Vienna soon, but this isn't a good sign. When the U.S. received Iran's latest response in the negotiations last Thursday night, a U.S. official criticized it as not encouraging and moving backwards. Details of Iran's response aren't yet clear, but the two sides appear to be at odds over guarantees that Iran seeks if the U.S. withdraws from the deal again and over the IAEA's inquiry into uranium traces at undeclared Iranian nuclear sites. U.S. officials said that they conveyed to Iran not to link the IAEA investigation with the deal to revive the JCPOA. Iran, they reiterated on Monday their call for the IAEA to close this investigation, but it's still not clear. We don't know if that is a condition to sign an agreement with the U.S. They could be pursuing that separately, using the negotiations as an opportunity to settle that situation. The IAEA hasn't been happy with Iran's explanations for the uranium traces, while even it's not a proliferation risk, but the IAEA still does not want to drop it. They want a better explanation from Iran. And also on Monday, Iran rejected the U.S. characterization of its latest response, um, saying that it has been that it was a constructive response and that it should create grounds for the conclusion of the talks. It should create grounds for ending the negotiations and signing a deal. So Iran's disputing what the U.S. had to say about its response. And one factor that could have impacted the U.S.'s criticism of Iran's response is pressure from Israel which is strongly opposed to reviving the JCPOA. As a deal between the U.S. and Iran seemed possible, Israel really stepped up its efforts to influence the Biden administration and Israeli Prime Minister Yair Lapid. He said on Sunday that the pressure was working. So we'll get more into that in the next couple stories here. The U.S. flew B-52 bombers over the Middle East in show of force aimed at Iran. The U.S. military said on Monday that two U.S. bombers flew a mission over the Middle East, a move that came amid heightened tensions in the region and amid these ongoing negotiations with Iran. The bombers departed from the Royal Air Force Base in Fairford, England. The U.S. military, they didn't mention Iran in the statement on the mission, but it's clear that the U.S. has flown bombers in the region pretty frequently in the past. And it's usually when tensions are high with Iran when they're trying to send Iran a message or when they're engaged in negotiations because this is how the U.S. uh, tends to negotiate. Um, According to the U.S. military statement, the bombers flew over the Mediterranean Sea, the Arabian Peninsula, and the Red Sea and were joined by warplanes from Saudi Arabia and Kuwait before leaving the region. According to the Israeli military, the U.S. bombers were escorted by three Israeli F-16s while they threw, while they flew through Israeli airspace toward the Persian Gulf. So that's from a, a statement from the Israeli military said that they were involved in this overflight, which is pretty typical. They usually escort the U.S. bombers as they fly over Israel towards the Persian Gulf, which is towards Iran. Uh, The flight came as the U.S. is, sorry, as Israel, again, is pressuring the U.S. on the Iran nuclear deal. And part of that pressure is that they've been pressing the U.S. to establish a credible military threat against Iran. 
Israel frequently, they carry out covert attacks inside Iran, and they've been threatening to launch more overt operations against the Islamic Republic. According to the U.S. ambassador to Israel, President Biden told Israel's prime minister, Yair Lapid, in a phone call last week that the U.S. would not tie Israel's hands, as he put it, to prevent Israel from attacking Iran. A common line we see from Israeli officials while these negotiations are going on is that they're not going to, that the if the deal's revived, if the JCPOA is revived, it's not going to stop them from attacking Iran. So the U.S. is saying, oh, yeah, of course, <laughs> it shouldn't stop you from, from do, launching any attacks. All right, so the next one here, more bad news for the Iran nuclear deal. Senator Bob Menendez, a Democrat from New Jersey, he said that the Biden administration has committed to submitting any agreement reached with Iran related to its nuclear program to Congress for a review. Menendez is the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. He opposed the Iran deal, the JCPOA, when it was first negotiated in 2015. So he's a longtime opponent of the deal. He said this while in Jerusalem as part of this Senate delegation that traveled to Israel that was led by Senator Lindsey Graham. So Menendez said that the administration committed to this review. They're going to hand it over to Congress. But he said he's not sure if Congress would be able to, if this means that Congress would be able to block a potential agreement, to block the Biden administration from entering it if they don't like it. He said, quote, whether that vote meets the threshold under the law to nullify that agreement is another question, end quote. So he said that his board, the uh, his committee, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, would be the first to review it, and then he would bring a vote to the Senate on the deal. But it's not clear if that's going to be binding in any way, because really, I mean, there's a good chance that it's almost certain that uh, the Senate would not approve an agreement with Iran. Virtually all Republicans are against it. Uh, Rand Paul has been uh, actually pretty good on it lately, but there's enough Democrats. I think Menendez being one that it would uh, it wouldn't really stand a chance. Um, so this is just another sign that even if this vote isn't binding, here's another excuse for Biden, who hasn't shown that he has the political will to lift sanctions on Iran. This could be another excuse for him not to return to the deal. You know, the Senate says he can't, so he might listen to them. All right, the next one here, this is from Jason Ditz, and uh, this is interesting. Iran denies being Israel's target in Syria. So Israel has been stepping up airstrikes in Syria lately, it seems like, although they do bomb them very frequently, pretty regularly. It does seem like maybe they've increased the airstrikes a little bit over the past few weeks. But whenever Israel, Israel usually doesn't comment on their airstrikes in Syria, but whenever they do, they portray it, they frame it as them bombing Iran. Uh, but this was Iran's foreign ministry said on Monday that it was absurd to claim that they were the target when they only had a very small presence in Syria. An advisory presence is what they call it. Um and Jason says the credibility of Israel claiming that they're always targeting Iran is has been in doubt because, again, there are limited Iranian troops. They usually hit Shia militias and, and that are made up of Iraqis, Pakistanis, Lebanese. Sometimes at, there's an Afghan militia that they target. Um, just because they're Shia doesn't mean they're Iranian. Iran supports and backs many of these groups, but um, to the level that they're you know, controlled by Iran is also pretty questionable. Each group is is pretty different. And also, Israeli airstrikes in Syria also frequently kill Syrian troops, Syrian government troops, and civilians, and hit civilian infrastructure. We just saw airstrikes at the Aleppo airport. Before that, there were some airstrikes on warehouses, and two civilians were injured. Um, so just this idea that they're bombing Iran in Syria is just completely false. And that's what... Uh, Iran came out and said. All right, the next one here. Ultra Hawk Liz Truss to be next British Prime Minister. So British Foreign Secretary Liz Truss will, rep will replace Boris Johnson as the British Prime Minister 
after the UK's Conservative Party voted to make her the leader of the government. She beat out former Finance Minister Rishi Sunak and is expected to for- to be formally named Prime Minister by the Queen on Tuesday. So Truss, as the British Foreign Secretary, she has delivered some of the most hawkish rhetoric against Russia in NATO's response to the invasion of Ukraine. I put together just kind of a few of her quotes of just some of the things that she's been saying throughout this war. Uh, When the war first broke out, Truss said that she supported individuals from the UK who wanted to fight in Ukraine. She said, basically gave people, British citizens that wanted to go fight against Russia, as the foreign secretary said that, you know, she supported that, which is pretty provocative. While campaigning to become the prime minister, Truss said if she took the position, she would follow in Boris Johnson's footsteps and be Ukraine's greatest friend to ensure that Russian President Vladimir Putin fails in Ukraine and suffers a strategic defeat. So calling for Russia to be defeated. And this was towards the end of July. Now we've seen this rhetoric from plenty of NATO officials and also U.S. officials, but the U.S. has kind of toned down that talk, even though their policy appears to be that they're just trying to prolong this war. And I guess they would, they definitely want to see Russia defeated or weakened, as Lloyd Austin put it, the Secretary of Defense. But according to a report from the Financial Times, Truss and her team have been frustrated with the U.S. that they haven't taken a harder line on Russia. Even as Washington has pledged over $13 billion in weapons for Ukraine, which dwarves the $2.8 billion in military aid that London has committed. And now that $13 billion, that's just in weapons that the U.S. is shipping to Ukraine or giving to Ukraine by financing arms sales, by paying for arms deals. Most of it is arms that they're just shipping from U.S. military stockpiles. But, I mean, the U.S. has committed tens of billions, and Biden just asked for another $13.7 billion, which would bring total aid. It's not all aid for Ukraine. It's being spent in many different ways. But total American spending on this war, on supporting this war, to over $60 billion, to about $66 billion, which is way more than the British have committed. Um, so the idea that she thinks the U.S. should take a harder line, I think, is pretty concerning. And now while the British are not contributing nearly as much money as the U.S., Britain is one of the leading NATO supporters of Ukraine. The British are currently training thousands of Ukrainian soldiers inside the U.K., and their goal is to train 10,000 within 120 days. I mean, 10,000, you know, that's a that's a very significant amount of soldiers that, that they're that they're training to fight against Russia. And according to reports from the Times and the New York Times, from the Times, that's the Times of London and the New York Times, British Special Operations Forces are on the ground in Ukraine. So they were one of the first, uh, the Times reported that back in, in April, and that was the first known NATO military presence in Ukraine since the war started because the U.S. pulled out the National Guard troops it had there, and other NATO trainers were pulled out right before the invasion. And then the New York Times later reported in June that the British, along with other European countries, have a few dozen commandos. So that was Britain, France, Canada, and Lithuania have special operations forces that have been working inside Ukraine. And this report also said that the U.S., that CIA personnel are operating inside Ukraine as well, which wasn't really a surprise, but they told the media that uh, that's really was the story when this came out at the end of June. So, I mean, this is the situation you have Britain, one of the most hawkish NATO countries in the response to the war in Ukraine being taken over by this Uber hawk (laughs) who is, I mean, I guess, Boris Johnson has been about as bad as you can be, which we'll get into a little more. But, you know, this is just such a dangerous situation that how much the the British are pushing uh, Russia. Um, And now this is who's going to come take over. So trust, she has also voiced her opposition to negotiations with Russia, saying that talks could only happen after Moscow is defeated. 
Johnson, he frequently discouraged negotiations and he reportedly played an integral role in the failure of earlier peace talks between Russia and Ukraine, a pattern that will likely continue under a trust premiership. I link to an article I talked about the other day about how Boris Johnson traveled to Ukraine after Russia and Ukraine appeared to make some progress on a peace deal. And he told Zelensky, don't negotiate. We're not going to sign a deal. We don't want to. Don't do it. Um, and he's since visited Ukraine again and discouraged a negotiation. So again, Johnson has been horrible. But trust just, you know, she's supposed to be in this her role where she's saying all these things. She's supposed to be Britain's top diplomat. Pretty similar to Anthony Blinken, how he's supposed to be America's top diplomat. And he's just been a total failure during this war. No diplomacy at all. And trust, she's also been hawkish in her rhetoric against China. And she's called for a global NATO that's capable of defending Taiwan and the broader Asia Pacific region. So she's all about global NATO expansion, which is something that the Alliance has its eye on is expanding into Asia to confront China. She's expected to be confrontational with Beijing and will reportedly classify Russia, uh, sorry, classify China as a threat to British national security for the first time. So she's apparently set to do that. This is according to another report from the Times that once she comes into office, she's going to declare China a threat. During a recent town hall, I played this video for you guys a couple weeks ago. If you want to check it out, I tweeted it out. Um, so trusted this town hall, and she was asked how she would feel that if she was prime minister and she had to order a nuclear strike, which uh, the person that asked her, the host, recognized would likely mean global annihilation and she said that she thinks it's an important duty of the prime minister and she's ready to do it and when asked again how would it make her feel because that was really the question not if you would do it how it would make you feel she just said i'm ready to do it and then the crowd applause um so that's who's taken over the uk and her party voted for her not it wasn't the, you know the vast majority of britons didn't have a say uh, it was just the conservative party that voted between her and Rishi Sunak, who's a former f finance minister. Then we have a couple articles up here about more about trust. One from the Middle East Eye about where she stands on the issues in the Middle East. And really the conclusion of that article is that it's going to be business as usual, supporting Israel and stuff like that. And then there's also an analysis on how British relations with China will unlikely improve under trust as i said from those from what she's had to say about china uh the next one russia warns that it will retaliate to the g7 oil price cap so russia warned on monday that it's going to retaliate if the g7 attempts to implement this price cap on russian oil this was from kremlin spokesman dmitry peskov so treasury secretary janet yellen and other finance ministers from the g7 they announced their intention to implement a price cap on Russian oil this past Friday, but the plan requires cooperation from Moscow, and Russian officials have made clear that they will not comply. Last week, when um, last week the Russian Deputy Prime Minister Alexander Novak he said, "quote We will simply not supply oil and petroleum products to such companies or states that impose restrictions." as we will not work non-competitively, end quote. So if Russia retaliates by cutting oil production, global prices will skyrocket. According to experts and analysts, analysts at J.P. Morgan Chase said that if Russia reduces its oil output by 3 million barrels per day, it would bring prices up to $190 per barrel. In the worst case scenario, they said Russia could slash production by 5 million barrels which would bring prices up to $380 per bar barrel. That's globally, that would triple, uh, more than triple the current price. That's the worst case scenario. But these were the predictions that were coming out. There's been some other very worrying ones from all sorts of experts and, and analysts and stuff, but they're still saying that they're going to go ahead with this plan. It's supposed to take effect in December when EU sanctions banning Russian oil are supposed to take effect. And the idea is that they're not going to be able to insure. There's not going to be any insurance for Russian oil shipments unless it's sold at this set price because the EU ban 
on Russian oil also bans insurance, and Russia still relies on Europe for insurance for its shipments. Um, but Russia would be able to find alternatives. It would there would probably be an initial shock to the market, but it seems like it's just uh, if they attempt to this price cap, it just isn't looking good, and it and it really looks like prices could really soar because it also relies on cooperation from China and India. All right, the next one here, this is from Kyle Anzalone and Will Porter at the Libertarian Institute. Ukraine asks Europe for more weapons, offers gas to curb rising prices. On Monday, Ukraine's Prime Minister, Denis Shymal, met with European leaders to request more weapons and suggest that Kiev could help bring down gas prices. Joseph Burrell, who we discussed earlier, the EU's foreign policy chief, he pledged that the bloc, the EU, would continue to support Ukraine no matter what. So Ukraine, you know, they're just asking for more weapons and they're saying that they could help alleviate Europe's energy crisis. I'm not sure how much they could really help there. Um, but, you know, the EU, Burrell also said on Monday that the EU has, you know, depleted a lot of its weapon stocks by sending weapons to Ukraine, but they're still saying, we're going to support you no matter what, no matter what happens here. We're going to keep giving you money and weapons. The last news story at the top section, uh, the Israeli army admits that it killed Shireen Abu Ekla, the Palestinian-American journalist who was gunned down by Israeli forces in May. So the an Israeli army investigation into her killing concluded that she was likely to have been unintentionally shot by an Israeli soldier, but was not deliberately targeted, the military said on Monday. Abu Ekla, a U.S. Palestinian citizen, was shot dead by Israeli forces on the 11th of May while covering an Israeli military operation in Jenin in the occupied West Bank. A statement on the investigation that was published on Monday said, quote, there is a high possibility that Abu Ekla was accidentally hit by IDF gunfire that fired toward suspects identified as armed Palestinian gunmen, end quote. And that's it. The Israeli military... Advocate General's office said that it would not open an investigation into any soldiers invest involved in the incident. So they're just saying, yeah, they likely killed them. It must have been an accident. There's no way they could have done it on purpose. That's it. That's the end of story. No further investigation. In a statement in response to the Army's findings, Abu Akla's family said, quote, Today, the Israeli government and military released a statement that tried to obscure the truth and avoid responsibility for killing Shireen Abu Ekla, our aunt, sister, best friend, journalist, and a Palestinian American. We've known for over four months now that an Israeli soldier shot and killed Shireen, as countless investigations conducted by CNN, the Associated Press, the New York Times, Al Jazeera, Al Haq, Betez Eslam, the United Nations, and others have all concluded. And yet, as expected, Israel has refused to take responsibility for murdering Shireen. Our family is not surprised by this outcome since it's obvious to anyone that Israeli war criminals cannot investigate their own crimes. However, we remain deeply hurt, frustrated, and disappointed. End quote. So they're saying that she was likely uh, fired by mistake, but she was wearing a vest that said press, and there wasn't a fight, a battle going on in the area. Um, and the, they're saying that the Israeli soldier was using a telescopic scope and misidentified her as an armed Palestinian gunman. But again, press on big vest said press, she had a helmet on too, and she was shot and killed. So that's pretty similar and pretty typical to how the U S and the Pentagon investigates itself when they kill civilians. Just one example, the U S drone strike that killed civilians, uh, 10 civilians on August 29th in Kabul last year in 2021, the Pentagon investigated it. They said that it was bad and everything, but nobody was punished for it. That's just the way it goes when a military investigates itself. Uh, but that's it for today. Uh, we got some good viewpoints you guys could check out. Um, you could contact the show news at antiwar.com, donate antiwar.com slash donate, buy some merch, Buy some t-shirts and all that. The link is in the description and in the show notes. Subscribe on YouTube. Share the show. That's it for today. I'll talk to you guys tomorrow. Thank you.